Okay, um, welcome everybody to uh, engage your students with Zoom with the, you know, getting your students to the next level. Uh, my name is Adam Finkelstein uh, uh, from Teaching and Learning Service. I'm here with my colleague, uh, Alex Leepins. Maybe Alex, say hello. Hi, greetings from the beach. Yes, exactly. We're both on the beach, uh, uh, if you can't see as well. Um, and the nice thing about being on that beach is um, we've decided we're going to, uh, to, to broadcast from the Bahamas. Of course, the problem with broadcasting from the Bahamas, as you can see, is that it's, it's, it's actually probably cooler than it is here in Montreal. Um, so what we're going to do is, is maybe just switch it up a bit so that it's a little bit more uh, formal and maybe a little bit more uh, uh, McGill oriented. So I'll take off my glasses, I'll change my virtual background, and uh, we'll just get things back to, back to normal. Okay, so engaging our students with Zoom. Uh, yes, I would love a pina colada, uh, Andrew, but uh, we don't have one at the moment. It's only one o'clock, but then again, it is five o'clock somewhere. Um, so uh, what we want to do is we're going to have a very interactive session here talking about engaging students with Zoom and moving ourselves to the next level. Uh, we're going to have a, a lot of uh, kind of interactive activities that we're going to do, and we're going to kind of take you to that next level from where you are now. We're assuming to a certain extent that you have actually reviewed the first level things of Zoom, uh, gone through, let's say, the online training from Zoom, know how to do some basic stuff about sharing your content, maybe doing a few things here and there. And what we're going to talk about today is really leveling up. Um, so we're not going to go over the basic things like, you know, how do you load a slideshow or specifically, let's say, how do you schedule a meeting or how to change your settings. We're going to talk about how to be much more interactive with your students come the fall term. Um, so that's something that, that, uh, that we're going to talk about. So before we get there, what I want to do is I'm going to give everybody the chance um, to, uh, uh, to interact here. And what I want you to do is plot your level in using Zoom on confidence versus interest. So um, if you look at the black bar that's going to be at the top or the bottom of your session and, and choose view options and annotate, you should be able to stamp something. You can put a question mark, you put a checkbox, whatever works for you um, as to where you are on this plot. So let's just see where you are here. So go ahead, keep going now. If the, by the way, if the black bar vanishes, you can drag your mouse to the upper bottom, depending on where it is, and it'll, it'll reappear, and you can start to put your uh, annotations. All right, perfect. Lots of stamps uh, showing up here, a couple of stamps. Let's hopefully get a few more stamps before we move on. Oh, we have a, we have a circle. All right, circle is good, circle's fine. Some more stamps as an example, excellent. Couple of people. Okay, so so you know most people seem to be in the high interest, high confidence. That's great. Some of you are in the high interest, low confidence. That's good. Um, anybody in the low interest and low confidence? I'm just curious as to you know what maybe maybe this isn't for you. Maybe you want to uh, go have that pina colada. Maybe that's a good idea. Um, but hopefully we can over the course of this session uh, get you into a real uh, uh, high confidence or at least a high interest level to be able to move from there. Keep in mind that all of our resources that we talk about today, every Everything we talk about today is all on our website. Uh, Kat, uh, who is our wonderful moderator, who's here in the chat, will actually be able uh, uh, to post those links and you'll be able to actually uh, follow up with any of those uh, links after our session. So what I'm going to do right now is uh, I thank you for uh, doing all of the drawing. I'm going to disable that here and I'm just going to clear all the drawings so we can move forward. But thank you for participating in our first part of Zoom. As you can imagine here, we're annotating atop of a slide here with Zoom. It's one of the features that you've got annotation that we're going to discuss in a little bit as well. So where do we want to go today? Our two major outcomes that we've got for our learning is one, identifying fixed and flexible strategies to engage students with Zoom. We talked about fixed and flexible in a lot of our webinars. Uh, fixed being everybody in the same place at the same time and flexible, meaning that you'd be able to, students will be able to do things on their own time. And the second thing we wanted to give you some uh, experience with is identify some next steps for learning more with Zoom. So Kat is an example of put, already put a little uh, uh, information there about our annotations and, and even talked about uh, some of our other webinars and our resources that you can see. You can also, if you look at the chat session on the bottom right and you click on the three dots that you see under the chat, you'll be able to save that to your computer if you want as you go. So let's talk about a one hour sample Zoom class. And this is one of my favorite links from uh, uh, University of Minnesota. And it just gives a 50 minute class and breaks it down by, by chunked activities about what you can do to really level up with Zoom. Zoom does not have to be a presentation for an hour. Um, what it can be is a, as a, as a, as a combination of a whole bunch of really great features that Zoom has to be able to enable you to get your students engaged. So here's a good example. If we look at the beginning here, 
We've got a five minute whiteboarding activity. On entry, having the students think about a question and write it on the board. I actually had you plot uh, uh, where you were on a graph as an example. Um, we might follow that up with a poll. Maybe use a poll in Zoom or a poll with polling at McGill to get students engaged and find out where their thinking is about a particular topic. Then there might be a mini lecture that you're gonna, gonna add on as well. You know, do a little presentation as an example. We might then have another poll the, to follow up from the previous poll, connect the polls together. Um, then perhaps do a breakout room uh, where we can break out our 100 person class into small groups of three and have a, a small group discussion. Maybe then bring that back for a debrief um, so that students uh, can have a further discussion along the way. Um, have a big chatter on, amongst everybody and then maybe have a debrief among the whole class and finish our hour off. So this is an example of a one hour session, but you can stretch it to a two hour session or longer, depending on what you're going to do with your students. So I wanted to start with that sort of sample class because that gives you an idea of where you can orient yourself to the types of features that we're going to talk about. Because the features that we're going to talk about today are, are chunked into two sections and Alex and I are going to trade off on some of these. The first are the fixed strategies and the fixed strategies we're going to focus on are one, making your content sharing interactive, really leveling up the kind of sharing that you're doing. The second is getting students engaged in class in multiple ways with things like chat, et cetera. And the third is getting students to work together. And that's really that breakout opportunity that we're going to discuss. We're also going to end the session talking about flexible strategies where you can get, you know, opportunities to schedule your Zoom sessions and then do things like record screencasts, demonstrations, videos, all sorts of stuff that you can do on your own in a flexible way to make content available to students or make recordings available to students and publish them uh, in the lecture recording system. So in order to think about making our content sharing interactive, um, in your Zoom screens, when you host a meeting, you have a special button that says share screen. And the share screen allows you to do a whole bunch of different things. So here's a weird kind of picture within a picture view of Zoom. Um, and this black bar that's at the bottom that you see has all the different options, security, participants, chat. I'm not gonna go over all of those because you can look at those online in the webinar um, that they have from Zoom to sort of start you off. In addition, we have our participants and our chat windows. What I'm gonna focus on is the green button that says share screen. And when you click on share screen, you get a couple of different options. One of the things that you get is the option to, to share your desktop, share an application, share whiteboards, iPhones or IK, uh, uh, via cables or AirPlays as an example, or even if you go to the advanced tab, share a part of your screen, music if you just wanna share music, and even content from a second camera, which is what I'm gonna to get to a little bit later. The third part, of course, is you can even share files directly from Zoom and have them available for people to look at. But those content sharing activities allow you to do a whole bunch of different things. And the first thing I wanna focus on is directing attention. And annotation is one of those things that's really critical when you're using either Zoom or any other application to focus people's annotation, focus people's attention on a specific part of the screen. So for example, if I click on annotate on my Zoom session and I actually draw, I can circle something in Zoom that I'm actually talking about. I can draw attention to a particular area as an example. Um, I could circle areas that are here. I could even write if I actually have a pen because you know, writing on my trackpad's a little hard, but a mouse is a little bit better. Now what's nice about annotation in Zoom is that it goes over top anything that you're showing. So if I'm showing Zoom or if I'm showing PowerPoint, if I'm showing anything, I can literally draw over the top of it as an example. Now I'm going to just clear all those drawings in a second and talk about the second kind uh, uh, of annotation that's right here, which is annotation in PowerPoint. Now annotation in PowerPoint, which is really interesting, is if I move my, my uh, slides in PowerPoint here, um, I have options of being able to annotate and change to a pen. And one of the nice things about drawing in PowerPoint is when I draw in PowerPoint, it stays within the slide. So one of the things you saw I was doing with Zoom is I'm annotating over top of any screen, but it's ephemeral. It's in a recording, but I can't go back to it if I've already erased it. One of the nice things about using PowerPoint to draw, and anybody who's done this in a classroom knows this is great, is that anything you draw on your screen with PowerPoint stays in that slide. So if I go to another slide and then I come back, I have my annotations. So it's really great if you're teaching math or other things where I can draw on top of pieces of my screen in PowerPoint and save those and make them available for students when I'm done. The second thing I want to talk about when it comes to sharing is explaining ideas. One of the great things about Zoom is that you can share any part of your computer, desktop, application, et cetera. So I wanted to focus on four really interesting ideas of how you can use this in instructional contexts. The first is one you probably already know about, which is presenting. I can present my screen just like I'm doing right now. Um, and I can use PowerPoint to be able to demonstrate an idea, talk through a session that I'm going to do, do a quick lecture, any of those opportunities. 
But there's also some interesting other options that I can do with application sharing. I can share any application. So that means, for example, I could share something like SPSS and do live calculations. So we could actually set up curves. We could actually run stats. We could talk about those stats, do everything live so that students can see what those ideas mean when you apply them directly uh, with at, your, when at your computer. In addition, we can actually do things like coding. So I could actually bring up a Java program, let's say, write out code, compile it, run it right there, demonstrate ideas to students. Again, being able to explain, concept, explain concepts and then directly apply them. Lastly, I'm giving you an example of music notation because we can use all of our applications to create things. So I could actually draw out, let's say, a, a, a music notations in a staff, or maybe I'm actually playing it on the keyboard right next to me and it's showing up on the screen. Um, or I'm using Finale as an example, which is a great program they use in music to make, you know, create a score, play parts of that score, you know, eliminate things. Let's say I'm going to take out the woodwinds. Let's listen to it again. All of that can be done with application sharing. And it's really one button push. That's all you need. Okay. The third thing I want to talk about before we get to some other ideas with Zoom is scaffolding concepts. Now, this is really where you can level things up, and that's with whiteboarding. And a lot of people have asked about whiteboarding, and I want to talk about four different areas of whiteboarding. And I'm going to show you actually this last one. Um, the first one is whiteboarding in Zoom. You saw the annotation that I was giving as an example. And one of the nice things with the annotation tool is I can bring up a blank screen and then just draw on top of it in the same way that you just saw. So if I bring up that annotation screen, I can actually start to draw on it as I would any other uh, a screen that I have on my computer. And if it's a white screen, then it basically allows me to actually draw out a notation or equations, which is really, really helpful for, for demonstrating ideas to students. Um, in addition, I can actually go the next level and use specific applications that are designed to do this. So for example, if you have, let's say, Microsoft Whiteboard, which is free, it's a whiteboarding tool that allows you really great drawing opportunities that you can draw on your screen, either with a pen or with a mouse or trackpad, however you'd like to do that. Um, there are other applications that are out there. You can use things like uh, Microsoft OneNote. Um, you can use any application that allows you to draw. You could actually, for example, use Photoshop if you were actually talking about art history and maybe do different shading that you're drawing uh, within the application itself. The third option I want to talk about here is using an external tablet. So you notice, if you recall back when I showed you, when you click share a screen, one of the options that's there is being able to share a tablet directly from your computer. So if you actually have an iPad or an Android device as an example, and you plug it in, you can actually share that tablet and draw on your screen uh, with your iPad as you would in a live classroom. Okay, and this is a really important thing that if you have these kind of devices, it can really level up the opportunities of how you want to draw and annotate. And what's nice about the, the tablet is you can sit back in your chair, put it on your lap and draw and everybody is able to see what you're drawing. Um, and that, of course, can be directly connected or actually you can do it wirelessly. So you can actually sort of move around your room if you really want to as well. So there are a whole bunch of apps on the iPad that are free to be able to do this, a whole bunch of ones on the Android that are able to do this. And the one last one I want to talk about is one that's a little bit more physical. And that's because it's a really different than the other three. All three of these are really talking about digital annotations. In other words, I'm drawing on a screen in order to make sure um, that I'm able to make things available to students. And what, one of the things I, I want to talk about is really leveling it up so that I can try something else where, okay, so drawing on a screen is one thing, but it's very awkward and I don't want to learn digital whiteboarding and it's just, it's just too complicated for me to do. You know, what can I do to just, I just want to draw on a piece of paper, you know, just like I would in a classroom with a document camera or in a whiteboard in a classroom or a blackboard, how can I draw? So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to draw on uh, a special thing that I've set up here. And I don't know if you can see, but I have, I have two soup cans. So I'm gonna show these soup cans. And I actually have wedged my phone in between these soup cans. And I'm gonna use a share and be able to share with the cable uh, using, my, uh, uh, using Zoom. It'll take a second to show up here. Um, and once I'm able to do that, and I'm just gonna turn it sideways, you're gonna see me with my, uh, with my wonderful little option here to share, and I'm just gonna sort of balance it out here. Um, now, if I was doing this in a particular session, I could spend a little bit more time talking about it. Um, but what I'm gonna do here is show you that I've got my hand, I've got my screen, and I'm able to actually have both my screen where you're seeing me in one corner and the ability to draw. So I could sit, for example, talk about, you know, A, uh, B and C, and I could go into a whole thing around, uh, you know, A squared plus uh, B squared equals C squared, and I could do a whole derivative
derivation uh, and some trigonometry from there. I, that's about a, the end of my remembering the trigonometry as an example. Or let's say I actually had five lines, and this is going to be a little bit rudimentary, and I'm just going to do a, a treble clef. It's not the best treble clef, um, but I could, for example, talk about uh, bars. I could talk about notes. Um, I could connect them together, and if I had staff lines here, I could draw out a whole example. So I think you can see an, an idea of what you can do with, with a, a adding your phone into this mix. And here's a third option. I can actually show objects. So let's say I wanted to talk about an object that I was showing under my camera. Could be a 3D graphical model. Maybe I'm showing a model of, a, a, of oxygen or something and demonstrate that. Or I could show my textbook as another example. So I just wanted to give you uh, ideas because those ideas allow you to do different things with your students and really level up the kind of sharing that we're talking about, um, be able to do whiteboarding with your students. So everything from digital whiteboarding to old school anal you know, analog whiteboarding. And I have to say, when you connect your phone like this and start drawing a piece of paper, this is the easiest thing in my opinion to do. And it's super simple, doesn't require special applications. And you can use a pen and paper and really draw out ideas that you want your students to be able to see. So with that, I'm going to move to the next section, which talks about engaging your students with Zoom at another level. And Alex is going to take over from here. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, thanks, Adam. And uh, I think we had a really great transition right there. I just want to acknowledge that. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the chat. So again, this is about leveling up the chat. You should already know how to open it, the little button at the bottom, and know that you can actually save the chat at any point in time by clicking the three dots right above where you'd type a message. So I know Cass been putting a lot of great links there, and you might want to be able to refer back to that later. So I invite you to definitely save the chat. So for student engagement and uh, interactivity, you can use the chat in a couple of different ways. You can go ahead and drop in, hey, what's the muddiest point? Uh, at any point and have students write in their answers. You can end a course by, excuse me, end a class by saying, okay, what's your takeaway from today? And then you can take that information back and say, okay, these are what the uh, students' takeaways were. You can review that and then debrief at the start of the next class. Now, we've got the chat set up here where it's a free flowing dialogue. You can have private chats amongst participants. You can private chat myself or Adam or anyone. And you can see that it's been running this whole time. Now, if you're facilitating a class, leading a class by yourself, it can be a little bit tough to have the chat running full steam while you're trying to run a tutorial or a lecture or even operate your document camera. So what you might want to do then is only turn on the chat for when you need it. And you can do that just by um, engaging it through the security shield feature at the bottom. So again, you turn it on when you need it and make full use of it. So the best practice for using the chat is be transparent about how you want students to use it. Know that you can use it as a great questioning tool. So any questions you have, things like muddiest points and so forth, and that um, you make it a planned activity instead of a chaotic free flow of ideas if that's what you want. If you're into the chaos, I say dive right in. Um, it's a great uh, source for information because if you do leave the chat running frequently, I guarantee you students will start to answer their own questions and then it becomes an opportunity for peer learning. So that's the chat. So we're gonna move on now to polling. Uh, so there's a couple of, uh, let's say layers to polling. We've got the quick and easy uh, built into Zoom and then much more sophisticated polling, which will be using Turning Point. I'm not gonna talk about that here. If you wanna learn more, please, please, please check out the live or recorded versions of the polling at McGill webinar. So the quick and the easy in Zoom is a couple of things. So at the base of your screen, you have a reaction command. You can at any point in time, check in with your students and say, um, am I making sense or am I not not making sense? And they can react accordingly. You see, I've got a thumbs up there. You can actually change the color in your settings of those emoticons uh, to suit your preference. Then if you click in the participants field, you've got yet another series of reactions. And one of the great things about these here in the participant fields, you've got yes, no, red and green boxes is you can ask very, very simple, um, alter two alternative style questions to a group and do quick and informal polling. So um, if uh, I were to ask you if you have a pet in the home, which is what I'm asking you now, do you have a pet in your home? And go ahead and click yes if you do and no if you don't. And as the answers come in, me as a co-host in this case, I'm actually seeing that information summarized. So right now I'm seeing four yeses and four noes. It's um, still even keeled. So what's great, it allows me to quickly quantify that information in an informal poll. And then when I'm ready to move on, I can clear all the responses and we can go forward. So again, that information is not captured for you anyway, but it is really, really helpful just to check in with students as you go. The next level up would be to actually use the Zoom um, polling feature, uh, which you can set up, but it has to be set up 
set up in advance. It'll allow you to ask up to a 10 alternative multiple choice style question. And what we're gonna do now is uh, show you exactly how to get, uh, get that started. So first and foremost, you wanna make sure that you go into your settings and have Zoom polling turned on. Everything has to do with the settings in Zoom, so just you wanna make sure that you do a good audit of that before you're doing any planned activity. And then it's as simple as going to your meetings, scheduling your meeting, scrolling to the bottom, and then clicking add poll. At that point, for each individual meeting, you're gonna to need to add the poll manually. Um, and when this is exactly what you're gonna see, you can put in your question prompt, the alternatives can have up to a 250 character limit, but it's a really fantastic way um, to have pulling your class. Now you can get reports on these polls afterward in your meeting reports in the Zoom settings um, area. Uh, it's a not really great for data visualization, but again, it just means that you do have access to that data if you want. But if you really want to do sophisticated polling, 100% you want to use Turning Point and check out the webinar on that topic. So next we're going to show you, oh, sorry, the, there is a, this is just the screen to show you where you get the report queue. So you go into settings, you pull the reports, and then you just want to make sure that you have the usage report time field correctly identified, and that'll allow you to export your CSV of your meeting polls. Again, it's not quick and easy for summarization or visualization, but the data is there. Now, my favorite feature, and I'm, I'm also doing a lot of webinars uh, for students right now on Zoom, and this is what students are saying is their most favorite feature. This is breakout rooms. So breakout rooms in a nutshell allow you to go from the larger Zoom meeting, which could be as many as a thousand people, to smaller group discussions, to, um, you know, uh, to debrief, to work on a problem, and so forth. And this also is really great for student engagement in this remote delivery context. So long story short, um, you, can, you can do three different approaches for setting up the breakout room. So first and foremost, you could just, in the moment, randomly assign people to breakout rooms. You can pick the number of rooms. You can have up to 50 breakout rooms per meeting um, and up to 200 people in a breakout room. Now, if you really wanna put 200 people in a breakout room, I might say rethink what the strategy is because that kind of takes away from the small group dynamic. But because you can have up to 50 groups, if you want to do something like a think pair share, which you might normally do in your in person class, you can do the same thing in zoom. So if you have 100 people on your call, create 50 breakout rooms and everyone goes in, into pairs uh, into those rooms through a random assignment and allows you to just do it really quick and easy. You can specify the time, the number of the rooms and boom, people are off to the races. Uh, a more sophisticated or customized way to do this is you can manually assign people to groups. And so basically you'll get the pop-up prompt to engage the groups and you can drag and drop people over. And this is great if you have TAs joining on your call, for example, you want them to moderate some smaller tutorials within your larger class. It allows you some customization there. Um, or if it's a small enough and manageable group, you can make custom groups on the fly. But if you really, really, really want to do uh, customized pre-assigned groups for the breakout rooms in Zoom, well, we're going to tell you, you can do that. What you do is you create the groups in my courses, you can export the .csv, and then you use that to pre-assign your meeting participants to the breakout rooms when you're setting up your meeting so that that's all locked in and ready to go. And I know many of you probably use quite a bit of group work in your courses, and this is a great way that if you have structured groups that you want to continue using in Zoom, that you can do that with the pre-assigned breakout room feature. Um, so don't forget that you can set this up in advance. You as the instructor, you can uh, hop into the different rooms at any point in time. Students can call you in. There's a, it's a summoning feature. And, um, and then you can still message them all from your higher level position and call them all back. So it's really, it's a really great feature and tool. Now what we're going to do is we're actually going to put you in a breakout room. So let me, just, <laughs> let me just start up by saying brace yourself. So what's going to happen, um, Adam is going to set the breakout rooms up now and you're going to go, uh, you're going to get a prompt shortly inviting you to join a breakout room. When that happens, click that. What will happen is it'll send you to the room. Once you get there, I invite you to, if you want, unmute and, un and enable your video and go ahead and have a very, very quick discussion. About how are you planning to use breakout rooms in Zoom in your courses for the fall? When I say quick and dirty, this is give you a chance to not only share some ideas, but then also experience what students experience when they go through the breakout room process. After a couple minutes, you get a prompt from us to return. Uh, before that happens, I invite you then to disable your video and mute yourself, and then we'll welcome you 
back um, and get to hear, and you'll get to hear a couple more really cool things about Zoom before one, we. Uh, one thing to add today. too is when you do go to the breakouts, you're going to lose our screen. So this is an important thing for students that I'm seeding you with this question here: How are you planning to use breakout rooms? Once we do the breakout, you're actually not going to be able to see that screen anymore. So something to keep in mind. So we're going to create those breakout rooms, um, and we're about to uh, uh, open all the rooms. Are you ready to go? Here we go. Everybody's moving. We'll give it a minute or two as everybody starts to come back. Not all back yet, but you know what? The timer is one of the key things because the, uh, uh, the timer actually allows you to, to uh, give people an indication that there's time going and the clock is running. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's not a problem. We're just going to wait a second until everybody gets back into the room. Mm. It keeps climbing. And, and while, uh, while we invite everyone to come back, so just that was a, the quick and fast uh, overview of what you can do with the chat, what you can do with polling, and what you can do with breakout rooms. So definitely I, I invite you as your takeaway homework, think about how you can use all three of those different features to stimulate student engagement and interactivity in your course for the fall, everything from the simple and informal to the more formal and sophisticated. Definitely keep it simple um, when in doubt, but there's some really great features and I know students have been saying that they really, really appreciate um, the opportunity to use the full functionalities available in Zoom. That's right. So, so the other uh, piece with those breakouts, you notice that um, for me to set up those breakouts was about three button clicks and off you went. Um, I had a notification of allowing you to extend the time because we set out a specific amount of time. And when that timer ticks down, I can let you continue to discuss. I noticed that actually Cynthia attempted to bring me into the breakout rooms. And that's something I, um, we didn't have time for, but I wanted to mention that, of course, you can actually be quote unquote summoned to the breakout room where a group student group will ask you for help for coming. What's important 
important to note about the breakout rooms is that we're recording um, from uh, the account that starts everything out, which is, uh, which is my account in this case. So if I went to a breakout room, it would record that breakout room. But for the most part, if I stay here while you're doing breakouts, none of the recordings uh, are going to capture what's in those breakouts. If you do wish to do that, students are going to have to record their own breakout rooms and give you those files uh, after the course is done. So it's something to keep in mind. And again, a super interactive feature. You can do it with very large numbers of people. And you notice that even going and coming back with 30 some odd people really wasn't that difficult. And it's something that you can do very easily by moving back and forth. The best feature that is an untold, you know, sort of an unmentioned feature is that we did random breakout rooms just now. If we go out and do a breakout session again, I can send you back into the same groups that were just created. So Zoom keeps track that even though you did the random breakout rooms, the second time we do them, it can say, well, do you want us, do you want me to keep the ones I sent before? So you can actually have a continuous discussion, even if you set it up randomly. So it's really a great option for students to, for them to engage. The last thing we wanted to mention is scheduling with Zoom and how that's important uh, in terms of making recordings available to your students. So there are two ways to schedule with Zoom. And, and I think people in the chat have kind of alluded to this. But you basically can schedule your Zoom meetings or your Zoom classes from my courses by actually looking here um, at the bar uh, that you're working on, on in my courses, or you can schedule them from inside the Zoom client. So if you schedule them from my courses, when you log into my courses at the very top bar, you're going to see a Zoom uh, a button that Zoom button brings you to an interface that allows you to schedule meetings. Um, and you can schedule all of your class meetings from here. It manages everything for you. It's really easy to do. And you have uh, access to almost all the same options you would in a normal Zoom meeting um, when you set it up. In addition, you can also set up from inside the Zoom interface here uh, and go to actually schedule. And it pops up a schedule meeting where I can actually decide on a number of different settings as I could when I schedule it from my courses. Um, and actually even go to advanced options and choose a few things like mute participants on entry. In other words, making sure people don't talk until you get there. Um, or maybe, sorry, maybe making sure people don't talk when, uh, when they show up in the room. And the second one after that is being able to say only McGill users can get into the room, which means you have to log in with your McGill username and password, making your Zoom sessions much, much more private and much, much harder for anybody to kind of sneak into as an example. In fact, if they do sneak in for some reason, it's because they're at McGill and you can find out who they are. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention about this, which is really important, is because doing these scheduling is that you can actually record everything that you're doing and make it available to students. And there are two options when you have uh, when you're doing recording with Zoom. When you decide to record a meeting, and you can actually set this up automatically. We always suggested you start it manually and stop it manually um, because it's just easier to control. Is that you can do this either by recording to the cloud or you can record to your own computer. And it's basically for two different purposes. If you want to record whatever you're doing, make it available to students, recording to the cloud is really the way to go. And I'll explain some real big benefits of doing that. Recording your computer is really useful if you actually want to make a video and then edit it or change it or modify it and then put it into, let's say, the recording system later. Well, what's really nice about using record to the cloud is that if you set up your schedules, if you set up your schedules with uh, uh, your course and do it inside my courses, the recordings will not only go into Zoom, but automatically get sucked into the lecture recording system and you can make them available to students right away. So it really is very, very little work on your side to be able to do anything when it comes to those recordings. So for example, when I actually wanna share videos, if I actually do a, a, a recording with Zoom and I go to the lecture recording system, and if you don't have the lecture recording system link on your toolbar, you can actually add it. And there's instructions for that on our website. Um, when you go to the lecture recordings, you're going to be given a whole bunch of different options here. A couple of them are, for example, manage recordings. If you're on manage recordings, anything you've done by, by scheduling a recording inside my courses with Zoom will automatically be pulled into here. You have to do nothing. It's just there. You can make it enabled or disable it if you want, but it's all automated. So all the stuff behind the scenes are done for you. So when you have your class with Zoom and you record it to the cloud, you hit stop recording and then you go into my courses and look at it and it's going to appear right here. In addition, there are a couple of other options here where let's say, for example, you forgot to schedule it inside my, my, my courses and you just did it on your own uh, and you have a weird name for the computer, the file or whatever it might be. As long as you recorded it to the cloud, this add uh, to Zoom recordings allows you access to all the recordings that you've made and you can pull them in one by one if you like. 
In addition, you have the ability to upload any video file you create. So if you don't use Zoom and you use something else, you can upload it straight into the system. Or last, if you actually use the recording system, let's say last year or, or in uh, last winter, you could actually access prior recordings for your course if you want to pull those in as well. So it's a really important option because that workflow where you're doing your recordings can all be automated and it can make your life a lot simpler if you're using the lecture recording system. So we want to wrap this session off today by, by actually asking a quick question in the chat, which is again, modeling behavior that you can do with your students is what are some strategies that you could use with your class in Zoom? Or what are some ideas that you might have about how you might use Zoom with your students? Um, and in addition, if you have a particular question that you could like to ask, feel free to pose that at this time. We'll be able to take some of those questions as we start to wrap it up. But first, what are some of the strategies that you think you could use from your class from this session? And, and while a few come in, I just want to go back to one of the first ones. If anyone's familiar with the game operation, I mean, you could, you could display a picture of anatomy and have the student use the annotation field to circle the relevant part of the body. That's part of the question. Um, you could also put up a Where's Waldo picture and ask for where Waldo is. And of course, that would have to be clearly aligned with the learning outcomes for your course. But of course, no one knows that better than all of you. But I, but I think that's a good point. And, and that's one of the great things about annotation is that ability to annotate or draw on a particular slide you have. So you can call out on students to actually come and draw. And one thing I didn't turn on, which you can, is show whenever somebody draws, it puts their name next to them. So you know actually who's drawing where. Uh, and it's a nice sort of addition that you can do as well. Um, so a lot of people are saying things like um, they want to use some annotation, they want to use breakout rooms, a couple of things about polling. Again, you know, Zoom polling is very, very basic. And we would only really say use Zoom polling if you just want to do like a question or two a semester. If you really want to do some sophisticated polling, and I'm talking about things like you ask students a question and then re-poll them and look at the answers in a cross tab, or you want to actually make sure you record students' answers through this, the whole term, that's really what polling at McGill's for. And we urge you to, uh, to take a look at that. Um, using your phone as a camera. Again, these are all sort of things that we talked about today. So I think that's, that's great to be able to support the drawing, um, getting uh, colleagues together and playing around. Uh, you know, it, that's, a, that's a great suggestion, Alex. And I think really one, do you want to elaborate on that a little bit more? Well, I mean, I, I, in many cases, it, it's a lot simpler just to actually try it in a low stakes environment and sin, also have the chance to experience the flip side of it. So you know exactly what students go through because like you might have the, uh, the right intention of sending everyone to the breakout room, but uh, just to make sure that like you're pr providing all the uh, necessary instructions and everything as the student goes through the whole experience and that it works exactly, you understand how it works ins and outs all and, the way through. Exactly. And, you know, and I think that's a really important thing is that, you know, you really do want to try this out uh, with colleagues. You know, it's very hard to do breakout rooms alone, Like you're going to have to try it out with some people. And, and actually, it's a really useful thing to do. Um, one of the other nice things that you can do and keep in mind is the screen sharing. I was doing the screen sharing, but you can actually have anybody in the room screen share. So that's an important piece to think about that if you go have students go into a breakout room, you can actually have them screen share back as to what they've talked about, summarize their ideas, etc. Um, you can also make somebody a co-host, like a TA could be a co-host, so they could help moderate chat, they could help share screens with you, and do all the sort of things that you would as an instructor. Um, so I think it's, it's you know, the, the really interesting idea is the plethora of options that are available to you. And I go back to the first slide that we talked about, which was really thinking about that one hour Zoom class. You know, and if you can think about the time that you have that you're going to be with your students, 50 minutes, whatever it might be, start thinking about that whole time and how you want to carve things up um, so that you you can split things between a particular lecture on an idea, a demonstration on something, a poll that you're going to do, and then maybe a breakout and how you might bring things back together. Because that plan is going to be really critical to be able to make sure that you really maximize the engagement that you have with your students. And I can tell you, once you start doing that with your students, they will, they will have a, a feel of what a, a, an interactive online experience can be that is far different than watching a recording online. And that's really what we want to make sure that, that people have the opportunity to that you know, having 39 hours of recordings to watch of somebody talking is really not the kind of engagement that students or anybody is really going to want to want to have. Um, you really want to sort of think of those opportunities to do the same kind of things you would do in a physical classroom and translate them in your head as to how could I do this online? What could I do as an example? Mm -hmm. So a couple of a key questions that people have asked, if you want to save the chat, if you go to the bottom right of the chat and click on the three little dots, once you click on that, you can click on the button that says save chat chat. 
all of the links that you've seen today are already on our website um, that uh, Kat will post maybe again, just as a reminder, so that people can get onto the website and, and be able to look at past recordings, this recording that will be up shortly, uh, as well as any of the links that we discussed today. Um, so uh, uh, I did have one or two people privately asking me some questions. I'm just going to mention here. Um, what do you uh, what do you need to be able to use a camera um, uh, to be able to have that external camera? You basically just need another webcam. So you go out and buy a you know a fifty dollar webcam or just use your phone, attach it to your computer. Voila, you got another camera. And then basically, I have to tell you, I use soup cans, but you could use books, um, or you can actually buy an attachment, uh, uh, an opposable attachment, which is the picture that you saw for about twenty dollars on Amazon. Um, you can have an attachment that you can move your camera around. That's really really helpful. Um, Adam, since think, the, yeah, since this ahead. is leveling up with Zoom, we should also know that you can actually download the Snapchat camera option and um, use Snapchat filters as your camera for yourself as well. Although I can't imagine a circumstance where you need to actually run a tutorial as a carrot or a potato. But I mean, this is about leveling up in Zoom. And so you got to know that there's a tremendous amount of options available. Yeah, exactly. Oh, a key search term, uh, Sarah, we'll, well, while we're talking, I'll, I'll dig up an example. Um, but basically what you're looking for is, a, is an iPhone arm or, or a phone arm uh, that you're looking for. And we'll post a couple of examples. We're planning on putting up a page that talks about like hardware that you can get for your teaching. And that'll be one of them. There was another private uh, message that came to me about how to do in-person and online things at the same time. Um, that's not something we're actually going to talk about very much because in most part in the fall, we're talking about remote teaching and there are very few examples of both an in-person and online at the same time and that's not something that we really want to go into plus you actually need approval to do something like that all the way up the chain uh, but there are options to do that it just makes things a little bit more complicated as an example um, so just wanted to remind you a couple of things one is that if you have any questions with assessment tools or any other ideas with my courses um, please have a look at the uh, my courses essentials you'll notice here there's 67 discussion posts that you can take a look at uh, as an example uh, um, of things that people are asking and being answered. We also have a whole bunch of webinars uh, that are available. All of these have all been done at one time or another, so the, all the recordings are already available on our website. In addition, there are up and coming ones um, that we have uh, uh, tomorrow actually is uh, uh, the last ones that we're going to have for a couple of days, and then we're going to come back in the beginning of July. And we're probably going to have some kind of sessions that you're going to see uh, later on uh, that people will have access to uh, as well. Um, so that's kind of the end of where we are with the questions. And if there are any other questions that you have, this would be a great time to ask them. Uh, I'll dig up that uh, link. Uh, maybe Alex, if there's any question that you could address, uh, uh, we can uh, uh, move, uh, address them now. Yep, definitely encourage you to put any questions you have in the chat. Uh, remind you to think about all the crazy cool things that you can do with Zoom and think about how you can integrate them in your course. And remember, Zoom is out of this world. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, so I'm just, uh, I'm just pulling up an example that I can uh, 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 show. So I'm going to post this in the chat. This is basically just a very simple opposable tripod. You can attach it. Uh, you'll probably have to copy the whole thing for it to work. You can attach it to a monitor, an arm or anything like that. And these are like $15 attachments to your phone. So uh, like I said, we'll post a few examples that are out there, um, but definitely want to give you uh, uh, some of those options. Um, I could, so any, I, yeah, go ahead. Just one other thing. So in addition to the attachment, um, you know, when it comes to presenting online, uh, you know, the mach modern machines will do everything you need to do in terms of being a good camera and having a good built-in microphone. So there's no one really need to get too crazy with that. But uh, lighting becomes really, really important. And so my, myself personally, I'm not using it right now because it's quite bright out, but I have a small $50 ring light that I got off of Amazon and under anywhere uh, under any circumstances that gives me really really great high quality light um, at a low cost and that does make a difference um, you know because in the online presenting world lighting is so much more important in many cases than other factors exactly so keeping with the the cheesy one-liners i'll say i hope you know you are over the moon uh, with all of the uh, uh wonderful things you found about zoom today um, if there are any other questions, we can happily take them. Otherwise, we're at the end of our time. We'll sort of wrap things up and we wish you all the best and all your luck. Uh, uh, check out a lot of the webinars and, and other information for the resources that we have on our site. As well, if you run into any problems, IT support at mcgill.ca or, or speak with us uh, uh, in any way that you'd like to be able to help you level up with Zoom. So good luck.
and uh, all the best and enjoy your uh, experimentation.